speak this. The other day, where's Victoria Lewis? She here, she might have been in church with her. She, okay, she might be. She, she had been suffering for six years with Victoria. She's like 21 years old, but she's been suffering with Crohn's disease, Crohn. I don't know if, you're in, if people have that in their, in their body right now, but at the end of the service, I want to do it. I want to rebuke that off of people right now in the name of Jesus. But and Crohn's disease just messes you up in the inside, intestines. It's, it's just a painful thing. She had to be hospitalized a while back for a month. And she'd been fighting this thing for five years. And I told her, listen, this is how you fight your battles. This is how you fight your battles. And it was wicked. It was wicked. Sometimes it gets ugly before it gets better. Sometimes it will get ugly before it gets better. Say, I understand. Sometimes it will get ugly before it gets better, but that's when you got to press in. And it was getting ugly. And I, see it just, I said, look, you got a girl. I know you got to come up with it. You got to go to the next place with it. And uh, about a week ago, she went back to the doctor for a checkup. And the doctor had to come back to her. He says, I don't know what happened, but there's not even a trace of that in your body. There's not a trace of it. He took off the, like, all the several medications. You know when she took off the medication, you've been feeling great again? Sometimes medication will do, sometimes, come on. Sometimes medication will do worse than what the story is. And she said, Pastor, I feel like me. I feel like my old self again. I said, come on. Because why? You've got to stand in faith. You've got to stand in. I don't know if anybody's here, but if anybody's here with, uh, with, with Crohn's right now, if you're, oh, listen, this is faith, man. This is, this is moving. You can sit back and go, I don't know. You know what? I'm going to go, stand up. If you're suffering from that, won't you stand? If anybody in the building is suffering right now, won't you stand up? Anybody suffering from that? We all good? We good on the left? We good to the right? Amen? Let's come against some infirmity right now. Lift your hand, infirmities. Lift your hands. I come against the spirit of infirmity over my body. I come against infirmity over my body, over my spirit. Lord, that Lord taking me out. Lord, I'm not me. I'm not, I'm not me. I'm not who I used to be. Lord, I... Lord, this thing's got me sometimes. I feel outnumbered and overwhelmed. But Lord, by the Spirit of God, I release healing. Lord, by His stripes, say by His stripes, I am healed. By His stripes, by His stripes, I am healed. He is my physician. Come on, He is my physician. Lord, I call you right now in the name of you. I receive healing to my body. Say, I receive it. I just jump. I receive it. I receive healing in my body. I receive it right now. I receive it. Lord, your atmosphere is here. Your presence is here. Lord, I receive it over my body right now. I declare healing over my body. I declare healing over my body in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, when, uh, when Cody and I were uh, learn, playing that song, and I heard it on, uh, one, uh, on my phone the other day, and it just resonated in my spirit, man. I'm like, man. We gotta see victory. I gotta see victory. I gotta see it. In Second Chronicles, you know, if you ever go to Second Chronicles, most people go to Second Chronicles chapter twenty. Uh, it's a story. It's a familiar story. But you know, we are, we so on, we so church that sometimes we don't realize what the story is and who the story is about. There was a godly king named Jehoshaphat, and. Just because you're, you're a godly king or a person that, that loves that's, that's a godly person, that doesn't mean that uh, you won't feel things. You won't, you won't go through some stuff. And the word says that there were three kings that teamed up to try to go against him. You see, Jehoshaphat, you and I, we have a destiny in life. We have an inheritance that God has called us. Say it's toward that sound booth right there. There's an inheritance that's mine. There's a victory that's mine. There was a promise that I know was mine. And there's a way to it. But the enemy will try to come in and block that way of getting into your promise. Not today, today, devil. Not today. And he tries to... So the enemy teamed up. Three nations came together against Jehoshaphat, and and he's a king of Judah. And they came against him... To form a weapon over him. What is a weapon? It is a scheme or a device or an assignment that the enemy has personally wrote against you. I'm going to leave you a word today. It may be formed, but it won't prosper. It may be formed, 
but it won't prosper. Even though darkness falls, it will not prevail. Woo, come on, I got to receive it. Even though darkness, sometimes it gets dark. <laughs> Even though darkness comes and darkness falls, it will not prevail. Why? My God in whom I serve only knows triumph and victory. The God in whom I serve only knows triumph and victory. He has never and will never lose a battle. This morning, I believe that same presence is here this morning. And when Jehoshaphat heard that word, the word says that he was terrified. Second Chronicles chapter 20. We're going to go, how do I fight my battles? And look, I'm going to see victory. And in this story, God gave a plan to Jehoshaphat. And I'm telling you, you can take this plan. This plan runs. The word of God says this, that Joseph was terrified about the news, what I just told you about. And he begged the Lord for guidance. In other words, he inquired of the Lord. Most people run around with their head cut off instead of inquiring with the Lord. Jehoshaphat inquired of the Lord, Lord, what's happening? What's going on right now? There's times you have to inquire of the Lord to say, Lord, what's happening? What's going on right now? He inquired of the Lord. He inquired of the Lord. And he also ordered the, tr- the church. He begged them. He says, you know what? When you don't know what to do, go on a fast and pray. Come on. Some people are the last resort. When you don't know what's going on, go on a fast and pray. Say, God, I need your direction. I need to know what's happening. What's going on right now? And the word says, when he begged him, he says, we got to come to a plan. Because why? I don't know what's happening right now. And Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord. He prayed, O Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are God who is in heaven. You are the rulers of the kingdom of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. O our God, did not you drive out those who lived in that land of Israel? Did you drive them out, Lord? And now they're here. And they, listen, they're here now. They hear these people are here. Your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name. They said, whatever we face, any calamity, such as war, plague, or famine, whatever, we could come and stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can, we, we can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us, and you will rescue us. Jehoshaphat wasn't reminding the Lord of what he all did. The Lord does not need reminding you need reminding, and you reminded yourself. David was good at that. David always reminded the Lord, did you not do that back then? And if you did it then, you can do it again. <laughs> See, he was reminding his spirit of what sometimes you have to remind yourself what the Lord has already done. And you get in your spirit and say, Lord, Lord, I remember the day you did this, and I remember the day you did that. And if you were faithful for this, you will be faithful for that. And you say, now you see these armies. There's three armies coming at me. And our ancestors, when they crossed over the Red Sea, they didn't take these things out. Sometimes when you don't take things out, your kids will inherit what you didn't take out. Woo! Sometimes if you don't take care of business, your kids will inherit what you didn't take out. The Lord means business. How many realize that when you don't take care of something, your kids have to deal with what you didn't take care of? I try to wipe out everything for my kids. I want to go and wipe out everything. I want them to, I want them to do further and greater than I've ever gone. I'm going to wipe out everything in front of me. He says, you see these three tribes? You see? They came out to destroy us. They came out to destroy us. But I know one thing. Just changes the whole story right about here. Jehoshaphat, he humbled himself before the Lord. Because why? He gives grace to those who humble himself before the Lord. Right now, in your time, the word says you need to what? Find mercy, obtain mercy, and find grace. The word of God in Hebrews 4, 16 says you can go to the throne of God with confidence. And you will what? You will obtain mercy and you will find grace. I want to lift your hands right now. I need, I need to obtain mercy and grace. I need grace. His grace, right? I need grace. His grace. Father, I speak grace over you today. I speak grace over you. And the word of the Lord says grace in his mercies, in his tender mercies. Renew you every morning. 
I receive it. See, I receive it. Oh, oh my goodness. Receive it in Jesus' name. And things change in the story. He said, Lord, we don't know what to do. How many sometimes say, Lord, I don't know what to do? He said, Lord, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are upon you. You see, when you're in trouble, you can do three things. You can look down and get depressed. You can look around and get confused. Or you can, get, or you can look up. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Come on. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Psalmist David wrote this. He says in Psalms 121, I will lift up my eyes into the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord. Say, my help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. Come on. He who keeps you will not slumber. He won't sleep on the job. Come on. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall never slumber or sleep. Say with me, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. Say that. The Lord is my shade at my right hand. The sun shall not strike against you in the day and the noontime. The Lord shall persevere. Like, what, what? Preserve you from evil. The Lord shall preserve you from evil. That which is evil, he turned around for good. And the Lord shall preserve you going out and coming in. Come on. I already see that. The Lord will preserve you from going out and coming in. And in the midst of that thing, they waited upon the Lord. Because why? We need an answer. In the midst of waiting for the Lord, he got the whole church, he got the whole nation to come into the sanctuary of God and say, we don't know what to do, Lord, but this is bigger than me and not you. This is bigger than us, but not big for you. And he said, as he waited before the Lord, the word says, and the spirit of the Lord came upon a Levite priest, the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God was unconsolable of a man, the Spirit. And he gave a word in the midst of a cry of a battle. And this is the plan how you want to see victory this morning. Amen? How many want to see victory? And in the midst of that, the Spirit of the Lord came upon a man. And he spoke out into the church. Listen, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, it will do three things. It, does, it will edify you. It will encourage you, and it will exhort you. And the Spirit of God came in the midst of that sanctuary when people don't know what to do. How do you know, how many know God's on time? Sometimes I think he's late. But he's never, I noticed one thing, he's never sweating it out. And this was a plan. I want to go through this this morning with you. I want to share this, this, uh, these words. The first thing he did this. They had to let go of fear. It was not their battle, it was God's battle. You write that down. They had to let go of fear. Why? Why, why did they have to let go of fear? Victory, in my, victory and defeat is determined in the mind. And fear will prevent you from speaking correctly. Fear will cause you to speak incorrect and say the wrong things. Say Amen. We have to get into our spirit that here it is. Fear activates the devil just like faith activates God. And he says this. Listen to all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, O King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Why would he say that first? Because fear and discouragement is, a, is an awesome weapon of the enemy. One will neutralize you and one will paralyze you. He said, do not fear or be discouraged by what you see. For the battle is not yours, but the battle is God's. What he's saying is this what? You get, your, you get yourself out of fear and I'll conquer the rest. Woo. You see, the enemy always wants you to embrace fear over you and say, what if? A high will. A high will do it. I don't know. But God wants you to brace this. I have and I will. I have and I will. Lord, I take authority over the spirit of fear right now over you. 
For God did not give you a spirit of fear. But they had to let go. You see, I can't, you have to let go. You have to let go of fear and let God be God. The second thing they did, told him to do is let, let go of fear. The second thing they did was what? You had to position yourself to meet the enemy head on. Word of God says this. They had to position themselves to take the enemy head on. The enemy did not go away. There's times, how many times people say, well, I'd rather just sweep that under the rug than deal with it. Before you know it, the rug's this big. Got to roll over it. He said you have to position yourself. That means this. You have to take courage and confidence no matter what. You have to take your stand. You're not. You're not. You're not going after my children. You're not. You cannot have my finances. You cannot have this. You cannot have. I re- I rece- look, come on, receive that. You're not. You have to position yourself head on to fight them. The enemy doesn't go away, but he wants to know where you take a stand. The word of God says when you do all you do what you do. You stand. You hold your position. You hold your position in confidence. He told him, hold your position. And many times people want to get in their car and run. I know. But sometimes you've got to meet the enemy on and say, listen, you're not, you listen, you're going down. You're going down. I had enough. Sometimes you've got to get something inside of you. That greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. You've got to take your position. You see, what happens is when you take your position, something changes. It brings in faith. Why? Because the enemy will always tell you what if. When you have faith, you start speaking even if. What? What are you talking about? Come on, you've got to receive that. Even if. Why? Not on your screen. Daniel, chapter 3. Three Hebrew kids would not bow down to a big statue of King Nebuchadnezzar. He said, if when you hear the music, when you hear the worship, ooh, somebody always want you to bow. He says, when you hear the worship, you're going to bow to my statue. You're going to bow to my statue. Three Hebrew kids said, we're not bowing to nobody. And the king said, let me ask you something. Who can rescue you from my hand? Who can rescue you from my hand? And I love in the story in Daniel 3, 16, one of the Hebrew kids says, King Nebuchadnezzar, I don't want to speak... Uh, I don't want to uh, speak bad about some things right now, but I know who you are. But here it is, and here's the facts. My God will rescue me from this fiery furnace that you're about to throw me in. But here he said, but even if. He said, but even if he don't, we will not bow. You see? Even if. Even if brings faith, because why? Listen, I know it could happen, but if it don't happen, he's still God. I still serve him no matter what. Even if. Even if he don't heal my body, I still serve him. Even if. But we know in the story that God did rescue you. Because he's a deliverer. Amen? Sometimes you've got to listen. Sometimes you've got to come to a place, you position yourself in confidence in the Lord. Let me tell you something. This brings in faith. Okay, let me, let me share with something with you. Faith is like that pause that you know what God told you, but it hadn't happened yet. How many know what I'm talking about? You know God spoke to you, but you haven't seen the result of it yet. It's that, you going across, you know. It's that pause. But in that pause... Do you take your stand and say, even if, I'll serve you anyway. Even if it don't turn out the way I thought, I'll serve you anyway. But I also said this, he says, take your position head on. But also he says this, you will not even have to fight. He told me, you will not even have to fight. Wait a minute. What? You won't need not even fight. You see? You get rid of fear, I'll handle the rest. Because your biggest battle is fear. You deal with fear, let me deal with fear, and I'll take care of the rest. He said there, you listen, let go of fear. He said, take your position. 
then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. Third thing is this. They, they had to stand still and see the salvation of their God. This is faith now coming in. This is faith. He said they had to stand still. Listen, stand still doesn't cancel out the battle. Standing still reminds you who you anchored to. Come on, that's Holy Ghost. Standing still does not change the battle. It just change, changes the position of how you held. Psalm 46.10, what it says, be still and know that I'm God. What does be still mean? Let's get it in the Greek. Let's get, some, let's get it to some Greek. What is it in the Greek? It's translated like this in the Greek. Be still literally means take your hands off this situation. I don't need your help. Did you receive that? He said, being still means this. Take your hands off this situation. I don't need your help. Just relax and take a chill pill. That's Pastor D version. <coughs> Pastor D tell me I'm taking pills. He says, relax. Why? We always want to be hands-on people. Come on. We try to, well, come on now. I'm, I'm the only honest one here in the building. I'll raise my hand. How many of you want to put your hands on something, want to manage it a little bit? You give it to God, but you still have a string tied to it. Come on now. I'm not talking, to, I'm talking, to, listen, I'm not talking about me, everybody here. You say I give it to God totally, but somehow or another I have a string attached to it. When you be still before God, you cut every apron string you said is yours. Because why? In the process of standing still, God is what? He's increasing your faith to hold. You see, faith comes by what? Persevering, what? Growing. It's the trials of your faith. It's the persevering your faith. Come on. That brings what? Maturity. Do you know that as Abraham was tested in his faith, the word of God says in Romans uh, 4, 16, that Abraham wasn't weakened in his faith, but his faith got stronger as he waited. What God is doing, he's not calling you to wait just to make you just wait and go, I'm waiting. I'm sorry. He said, I'm trying to build you. I'm trying to build your faith right now. I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to get something inside of you that you didn't know you had. I'm putting some resilience. So when things come, you won't cop out, but you lift your hands and say, Lord, what if, even if, I'll still do it. Even if, I'll serve you. But sometimes he says, be still. When we still, our confidence is no longer in me. But my confidence is in him so I can relax. How can, you, how can you just do this when all this is going on? Honey, my confidence is not me. My confidence is him because the battle is the Lord. The battle is not mine. Sometimes, listen, we've got to give him totally our battle. And that's called the cross. And the word says this. We have to stick, be still and see the salvation of our God. When you're standing still, you can see. But when you're running around with your head cut off, you don't know what's happened. But when you're standing still, you can see that. Uh, you can see the Red Sea open up out of nowhere. You can see it happen. And when you start seeing it, you begin to speak it. And when you begin to speak it, you begin to seize it. When I start seeing it, when you start seeing your kid turn around a little bit, you go, you know what? I'm starting to see it now, and I'm starting to speak it now. And when I speak it now, I'm going to seize what I speak. It's time the church starts seeing things and speaking it. And come on and seeing it and speaking it and seizing it in Jesus' name. We see, listen, when you see it, you have to start speaking God's word. God's word is victory. God's word is victory. And we've got to start declaring God's word over our situation. It may look like you're outnumbered and overwhelmed, but fear not, for the battle is not yours, for the battle is God's. Yeah. And fear not. Fourth thing they did. They had to believe by faith. That God would defeat their enemies. Woo! See, all that stuff was building something in you. It's called faith. See, faith is this. It's the God-given ability to see. To see. Provision. See what you need. And when circumstances are overwhelmed and outnumbered, you see God's hand. When nobody else sees anything, you see God's hand. 
Because the word says without faith we can't please him. But faith brings in the power of God and faith brings in the miraculous. You need the miraculous in your situation right now. You don't need a patch on a tire. You need a whole thing right now. And he says this. Faith sees the miraculous. But you have your faith will be tested. You don't get a great testimony without no test. Huh? I've never seen if people get a great testimony, and oh, I just kind of breeze through it, nothing happened. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, Pastor, whoo! If I've got a testimony for you, because why? That testimony is what keeps you at times. That testimony reminds you of what he did for you. But sometimes when you don't have nothing to hold on to, I hold on to the testimony of what I am now. I hold on. Listen, how, look, I was, what, look, come on. I was lost, but now found. I was blind, but now I see. I remember the times. David always would rehearse the times in his spirit. And he said when he rehearsed those things, faith grew, and the spirit of the Lord came upon David. You see, we have to believe in faith that God can truly Truly, no matter what, take out any enemy you have. I don't care if it's finances, healing, whatever it may be. That God can take it out. That nothing is impossible of him. But your faith will be tested. Jehoshaphat gave these words. He said this, look, he said this. The next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. They're going out to a battle. See, the battle had not been won yet. But they had to go to the battle line. Sometimes you have to go to the battle line and let God work. So the army, his army marches out to the battle. On the way out, Jehoshaphat stopped. 2020 says, listen to me all, you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets. And you will succeed. Look what we said here. Stop what you're doing. Wait a minute. Believe in the Lord your God, and he will be able to stand firm. And he also said this. Believe in the people that spoke over you. Here it is in the church today. You have pastors here. You have to believe in your pastors when they speak a word over you. They're hearing from God. He said, believe in faith. That what those people say over you is going to happen. Listen, your pastors are here to build you up in faith, to conquer anything you have. And your pastors here believe that God can do anything. We just listen. We just believe the word of God, man. So when either pastor speak the word over you, he says, believe in those pastors who speak over you. They're not against you. They're actually for you. He says, and if you, ha- if you do that, it says you will what? You will have success. Ooh. How many want success? Lift your hands right now. Father, I speak that. I need success over what I need. Lord, I need to be on top and not on the bottom. Lord, you call me to succeed. You call me to be a champion. You are a champion. Jesus said this, in this world, you will have troubles. You will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And if I have overcome the world, you will overcome the world. The same spirit that rose Christ from the dead now dwells in you. And when I speak success over you, I speak testimonies. How God, you went before the Lord and you had success. Listen, you, God, can't God show that why? Say he's a way maker. He's a way maker. He's a way maker. He's a way maker. We just believe that there is a way maker. Even though sometimes we feel overwhelmed and outnumbered, I know this, if God be for me, then who can be against me? And I know that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Come on. And I know that all things are working together for good. Even though sometimes I don't understand it all, in the end, you take that which evil and you turn it for good. They had to believe. They had to believe in faith. They had to rise up and go, you know what? But nothing has changed yet. Nothing has changed yet. Four things happened and nothing, it was all preparation. Because now they had to go to the battle line. But now they're going to go to the battle line with a different spirit. 
Why do you think before a big game, um, old movie, old ba- I'm taking you back to throwback, facing the Giants. Why do you think that coach went in that locker room and said, you've seen what you see out there. Them guys are 85 deep. Them guys look like they belong, to, they belong in the NFL. And here you are, a little small thing here, over here. But he said, but they don't know what's inside of you. What was he doing? He wasn't pumping them up. He was getting them to believe in who they were. Because why they believed in their leaders. It's time the church sometimes gets a hold of a culture change and believes in their leaders. Amen? And he stood there and he said, I know that. They outnumbered. You look outnumbered. They look big and overwhelmed. They don't know what's inside of you. What I'm trying to say is this. You may feel like you're outnumbered and overwhelmed, but the enemy don't know that God is inside of you. Receive that. And the fifth thing they had to do like this is this. They had to worship and praise like the battle had already been won. <laughs> Listen, did it? the first four just get you to the battle line. Now, they had to do something. They had to worship and praise like the battle had already been won. Anybody can thank him after the fact. But how many can thank him before they even go to the battle line? You see, he said praise. This is what praise does. People don't say praise releases the burden of depression and anxiety. Proverbs 12, 25 says this. Anxiety of the heart will cause a man to have depression. Anxiety of the heart will cause someone to have depression. Praise releases the burden of depression and heaviness. You ever get into a room and somebody starts praising them and the heaviness like goes out the room. It's like a vacuum, like somebody sucked it out. What happens is praise will take the burden of anxiety, which leads to fear. And the time is, Praise has to come when you don't see anything happening, but you believe that something will. And the word says, they began to worship. What does worship do? Worship takes you out of your small picture and sees the big picture of what's happening. Because when you're looking at the little thing, you're looking right here only. And guess what? God says, listen, you're working through a 19-inch thing. i got a big 75-inch crab thing looking at right now. Listen, Bell, this is it. Worship takes you out of what you're seeing and about now seeing God behind it. You see, worship has to be true because it's hard to worship when you don't feel like it. But when you worship when you don't feel like it, it shows that, listen, it shows that I'm unconditional. I'll worship you regardless. I said this morning, what does worship do? Worship does this. It restores your joy. Write that down. Worship restores the joy of your salvation. Why? Because when, you, when your joy leaves, you can't worship. It's hard to worship when you, listen, but when you begin to worship, joy comes back. And the joy of the Lord is what? My strength. The Lord wants to get you a place where you can worship me before you even have an answer to your victory. Anybody can praise him after it's already done. Don't take any, even a heathen can praise him. But he says, you can praise me before the battle. The battle is no longer yours, but the battle's mine. How many need that this morning? And also, recalibrates your spirit. When you worship, your spirit man gets recalibrated. What? You get your timing back. How many know what it is to be out of time with things? You just feel like you don't feel, feel like you're just not in the groove or something. Worship will recalibrate your spirit to get your spirit man back to thinking again. Your spirit man will get you back to right thinking again. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And the third thing is just worship. Worship will renew your mind. Worship will renew your mind. And renew your mind. You see, when you start, your mind gets renewed, 
Because what? Victory and defeat begins in what? The mind. So here we go. He sets up his troops all in line. But I want you to read the story. How do you go to battle and his, troop ha- and his troops never had a sword or a spear? Usually when, a, well, usually when they go to battle, if you read the Old Testament, they'll say he had like 7,000 chariots, 3,000 foot show- soldiers. He'd tell me he had spears and swords. You don't hear nothing about this. They went out to battle with songs. They went out to battle with songs. Worship is a powerful weapon. And the story will show you that worship, songs will defeat spears and swords. In this story, you never hear of them taking any armor with them except the armor of faith. And they stood out in rank. And what he did was, he says, you know what? This is how we fight my battles. Send the worshipers out first. Too many times we, don't, we, too many times we send the worship out last when it, after it's all done. He said, no. Send the worshipers out first. Here's the word of God. Here, let's go. After consulting with the people, the king appointed singers to walk out ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. And this is what they sang. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. That's all they sang. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Word of God said this. At that very moment, the first four I told you was getting you to verse five. five. They had to worship and praise as if the battle had already been run. Say at that moment, say, say with me, at that moment, at my moment, at my moment, the Lord, they began to sing and give praises. And the Lord caused the enemies, Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, to start fighting against themselves. The Lord said, you will not have to fight this fight, but if you worship an enemy, I'll go before you in battle. And you watch your enemies be defeated before your very eyes. For I am a God, and I only know triumph, and I know victory. I have never been defeated. And they stood there. And the armies began to kill each other one by one. And after they destroyed the army of Syria, they began attacking each other. So when the army of Judah arrived to look out of the point of the wilderness, when he finally exactly got to the battle line, they looked. And they saw dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. Listen, King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather and plunder. They gathered the plunder. They went out. They found, look, they found vast amounts of equipment and clothing and other valuables, more than they could carry. There was so much plunder that it took them three days to collect it all. I want to see a victory. You want to see a victory? Take your phone out. I want you to snapshot that screen right over in a minute. Take your phone out. Take your phone out. You want to see a victory? Here it is. Five things. Put it on screen. Say it with me. You gotta let go of fear. Snapshot this. Get out five up there. Can we get out five up there? I don't know why we. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm looking at the other one. I'm looking at this screen. I'm sorry. They had to let go of fear. Snapshot that. We have let go. Say, let go of fear. Put this in your, put this in your phone. You had to let go of fear. 
You have to hold your position. You have to believe by faith. You have to worship and praise as if the battle had already been won. Woo! That's a toughie. But you know what? He gave you host of that a plan. I use this plan in my life. I have to let go of what I hear inside of my head. What I hear inside of my head is not good. And then after I get rid of all the noise, I hold my ground. And then I stand still and I start to see who he is and who I'm not. Then I have to lead by faith that he will do what I just see. And I have to worship and praise him before they all, it all came in. Father, right now, I thank you for the word today. I thank you for your spirit. Ushers, I want you to come forward and receive the tithe and offering. I forgot to do that today. Everybody's looking at me like that. Go put the money. Just quietly put in tithe and offering. Father God, I speak it right now. Collect the offering right now. Jesus, I speak the word over you. As we go through, just put in the offering.